Well, to your point, and I know we're, I'm, I'm down to zero, so this will be just the last comment, Mayor. Look, there, there, there's uh, much that uh, I agree with you on. Uh, this one I, I, I disagree with you on. Uh, I believe if, if we're going to focus on those education funds, those AIM funds, those other areas, then we should, we should do so. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of folks get aggravated about the, the shell game that's played. And, you know, there's $600 million on the table. And just from my perspective, again, as an upstater, as a Western New Yorker, uh, after this refinancing, I believe that that, that funding uh, mm -hmm. could be utilized in, in our area of the state uh, as much as anywhere else in the city, including this state, is including the city of New York. I, I know you're saying that in good faith, and I just want to respond in good faith. The CFE decision, which was also uh, aimed at helping Buffalo, for example, and other upstate cities, uh, if I, and I say this with absolute respect, if we all could restart that discussion productively, then it might be possible to talk about different trade-offs. But I have to say, over the last couple of years I've been mayor, I've presented the concern. I, I understand that people have felt like it's something they couldn't really entertain, for better or for worse. But we're not having that conversation. Let's be straightforward about that. If we were having a conversation about restoring the AIM money that was supposed to be a one-year pause, and now it should come back on the table, if that conversation were going on, we would be having, we could have a more holistic conversation, perhaps. But that's not what's happening. I don't mean that to be negative. I'm trying to be very constructive and positive. Somehow, in all the back and forth, some things come on the table, some things go off the table. And uh, I think the, when you tote it all up, we certainly know some of those have hurt us quite a bit. Uh, on this one, again, we feel it's, it's straightforward. I understand your frustration. I hope over the years we can all find ways to rationalize some of these things and make sense of them for the long haul, but certainly just taking the narrow question of the AIM money, what does it feel like to you know, the people in New York City that we were supposed to have a one-year pause and we've never seen it again? I'm sure you can give your own parallel examples. Until we're going to put all of that on the table, it's hard for us to want to say, let's just give away something that we believe is guaranteed to us. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I do have a couple of additional questions, uh, and then we'll close. So um, as you pointed out, um, I've been very involved in housing issues. We've worked together on housing issues. And I agree with you. I want to go to page six of your testimony, because I had a question there. You talk about the bond cap allocation being a vital resource for the city. And I fully agree with your assessment regarding that. And you also pointed out that last year the city's Housing Development Corporation efficiently used all of its state bond cap allocation to fund its projects, which is true. But then you go on to say that HDC couldn't even get started on almost 1,200 affordable apartments across the five boroughs simply because it did not receive enough in bond cap allocations from the state. And so my question is, isn't the HDC amount an amount that is determined and requested by the city? And so if you ran out of money, did you ask for too little? No. In fact, we asked for more. I'll start, and my colleagues may have more uh, a sense of the details, but I'll give you the overview. We certainly asked for more. And um, we understand that there's a, a statutory amount and then beyond that a pretty consistent history of additional resources coming in in terms of where the projects could be most uh, effectively achieved. And look, that's again, this is not a Democrat or Republican or upstate or downstate thing. We all want the taxpayers' money used well. So we would rather see resources go to a project ready to go than be held for something that's not ready to go or a project that is going to yield more affordable housing versus less. Uh, in this instance, those uh, units were ready to go. The state was quite aware of it. We had requested the additional authority, and we were told it was not going to be made available, even though we think it could have been made available. We uh, were obviously working in good faith to keep moving these efforts forward. We don't want to add additional layers that we think will only slow down uh, a structure that right now needs to move as quickly as possible because of the, the desperate need for affordable housing. And I agree with you, there's a desperate need for affordable housing. And actually, um, I'd like to applaud you for your goal of developing 200,000 new units of Thank affordable you. housing. I think it's absolutely necessary for the future of the city. Um, and, but I, I do want to point out a couple things because, as you know, I think you know this, that it's extraordinarily expensive to live and to work and to do business in the city. 
And it's a result of several dynamics, and you've pointed some of them out today. One of them has to do with the tax burden that we have in the, in the city, and I want to applaud uh, Senator Lanza had to go to another hearing, but I want to applaud Senator Lanza for his focus on property tax relief for the middle class in his district, for seniors on fixed incomes, and um, you've pointed out that you are opposed to a property tax cap. You just made that very clear to Senator Kennedy during your remarks. Um, but at the same time, when you're saying you're not raising property taxes, as Senator Avella pointed out, maybe that's not happening, but assessments are going up year after year, and as a result of the assessments going up, then we have the net effect of property taxes going up. That's a real impediment in so many ways to growth in the city. Um, and as a result, um, based on that, based on ex you know, exorbitant land costs, based on the high cost of doing business, whether it's regulatory, a lot of extra bureaucracy and so on, all those things drive up costs in the city. And so it has exacerbated the housing shortage that we have in the city. Um, and so as a result of that, I would suggest that there's a structural problem that you're dealing with, with regulatory systems, with tax systems, with the cost of land. And have you considered what you could do as mayor to tackle that structural problem that you have because that is actually contributing in such a big way to the housing shortage that you face right now. I appreciate the question. I think you're right that there are some really big factors at play here. Now, I would argue we have, uh, I used to use the phrase, a tale of two cities. I still use it sometimes, and I'll use it in this case because we have it in this sense. One, there are some exceedingly positive factors that are actually complicating things, right? The increased, uh, value on our land and on our buildings, our real estate values just continuing to grow is obviously a blessing on so many levels and indicates economic strength. The fact that the city is growing physically in terms of population, growing in terms of job growth, these are wonderful things, but they also put immense pressure on the affordable housing equation. So in that sense, the success you want creates some real unintended consequences. If, if the question is, do we need to rethink uh, some of the elements of our tax structure, I think that's a fair point because I, there's always been a certain amount of inconsistency and, uh, and lack of clarity in the New York City property tax system. It's something that would have to be done very carefully, very intelligently. It's something that would take a lot of work, but I've said long ago, I recognize there are challenges and problems in our tax system that have to be looked at. Um, at the same time, the thing I can do right now and we're all you know, here to think about what we can practically do to help people. What I can do right now is make sure there is not a property tax rate increase, which one thing I think would unify all the uh, homeowners of New York City is that that would be an added burden. We've avoided that for now three budgets in a row, and we're gonna keep avoiding that. But in terms of coming back at these underlying issues, you know, ways that we can help our seniors, ways that we can create more consistency in our tax system and more consistency across the different parts of the city, these are real issues. I'm certainly going to be looking at them. I've been thinking about ways we could approach them. The one thing you'll appreciate, that will take a big, complicated structural fix, and it will take time to sort that out for sure. Right. I, I think you're right for sure on that point. Um, because every time property taxes go up, there is an impact, for example, on rental housing also. And tenants in market rate apartments, you know, have their costs go up because the property taxes go up, because the assessments go up. Tenants who live in rent-regulated apartments, the costs go up for owners, and then the owners aren't able to fix their building. So there is an impact on tenants. There's an impact on homeowners. There's an impact on businesses, there's an impact on the ability to develop more affordable housing. So I think that those are very, very uh, dire issues that need to be looked at. Um, you know, we talked, um, and, and so as a result of the heavy costs associated with doing business in New York City, the only economic development tool that we have is the 421A program, which, as you know, provides incentives and benefits to develop affordable housing units. And so I would just say that we need to t take a look at that again, because right now there's nothing 
to be able to develop affordable housing, and that is a critical issue that needs to be addressed, and I'm sure you would agree with that. I agree, and I, we would appreciate, and we know you've worked closely with us, we'd appreciate deeply your help and your leadership because we think there is a solution available uh, given the, uh, the plan we put forward, which had widespread support. Uh, we think there's a way to reach that plan or something like it and move forward. But the bottom line is uh, we have uh, a need to keep uh, moving the right kind of development forward so we can create that affordable housing. There's no reason for it to stall if by uh, good decisions here in Albany we can keep it moving. Yeah, so thank you for that. You also talked about um, you know rent control, rent regulation, and uh, units going out of the system. But the reason those units are going out is that the people living in them have, heard, have actually hit a certain income threshold. So these are high, people with higher incomes that are going out of the system, and I'm sure you would agree with me that those kinds of um, assistance through rent regulation really should go to people who truly need it. And so we have programs like the Senior Citizen Rent Increase Exemption Program that actually freezes the rent for people who are seniors on fixed incomes who can't afford to pay their rent because it's so much of their income every year. And you know in 2014, the legislature actually changed the amount from $29,000 per year up to a threshold of $50,000 a year, which actually has helped a lot of seniors in New York City. Same with, there's similar program with, uh, for people with disabilities with a freeze on rent. And you probably know that I sponsor legislation to do the same for all tenants um, who make $50,000 a year or less and pay a high amount of their income toward rent. And I'd like to see that um, move forward because I think that's a much more positive solution um, than the current system. With that being said, um, I noticed in, after we had passed that in 2014, there was an article in the New York Times, I think it was May 20th, that said that the city needs to do a better job in getting the information out to people who qualify for the screen and dream programs. And then there was a follow-up. I was very interested. Um, right after Christmas on December 31st of 2015, there was a follow-up article about a senior in a rent control department who was concerned because her rent may be going up because she wasn't under the same freeze as the rent guidelines board. But the point was is that she qualified for SCREE. And I noticed that right away in that article. And I guess the question is, what is the city doing to help those people? And should there be a better focus on making sure the word gets out to those renters? Well, first of all, and I'll turn to Dean and Sharif in a second, but let me first say thank you for your leadership in uh, adjusting that income level. That was absolutely crucial for people all over the state and certainly in the city as well. And we appreciate that deeply because that reflected the reality of people's lives to have Scree and DRE adjusted that way. We uh, do engage in very energetic outreach efforts. We're trying to improve upon them and strengthen them. We know a lot of our colleagues, local elected officials, do as well, and they're key partners in that. So I agree with you. The last thing I want to see is anyone having that right and not taking advantage of it. We've tried to, on many fronts, do a better job, because I think previously New York City government was not sufficiently communicative with its people, so we've tried to you know, fix that on many, many fronts. In terms of Scree and Dree directly, Dean right. or we, we will come back to you with specifics. We are, we do recognize that, and we are taking, the mayor's right, to, he has directed us to take much more active outreach on Scree, on Dree, and actually on the EITC as well. I think you'd be helping a lot of very uh, right. needy people as a result of that. And it, as you also know, we fundamentally, philosophically disagree about um, price controls and rent control. And, and uh, you know, on our side of the equation, we believe that it has exacerbated the housing shortage in New York City. It was supposed to be temporary from 1943, and it's still in place. Um, and, you know, better solutions. We all want a more affordable housing. Uh, better solutions would be a free market system, um, developing more affordable housing, and actually having a system that addresses the most needy people who can't afford to live. So that's something that we um, continue to work on. Senator, um, if I may, just despite, despite there may be some philosophical differences, in addition to thanking you for the partnership on many fronts, I would say we also have put a very clear focus in our affordable housing plan 
on promoting the creation of market rate rental housing. We all know uh, the reality of the new higher priced condos that have become such a big part of the housing landscape. We think, I think this may be a point where there's some agreement, that a robust market rate rental market is very good for the overall availability of affordable housing. So we have a series of actions that are part of our overall plan to support and encourage that development as well uh, for the good of all. Okay, thank you for that, Mayor. And just um, one final question, you know, going back to the questioning at the beginning. You know, so we have the budget in place for New York City through the state right now for this year. And when you compare the budget for this year with the proposed budget from the governor for 2017, which one is better? Which one would you prefer to see if you had to compare the two? I have to, I have to honestly say to you that there's so many unclear points in the current budget. There's so many unanswered questions that I can't in good faith give you a perfect comparison. Maybe when we've gotten all the facts, I can answer that better. Uh, obviously, almost a billion dollars that at this moment uh, we're assured will not uh, be manifested as a cut. Uh, we need that to be ratified as we go forward. That's an area of tremendous concern. But overall, there's just a lot of elements of this budget that we don't have the full facts on. We deeply appreciate, as I said, the very first words of my testimony. There are some elements of this budget on the support of housing, for example, that I am exceedingly appreciative for. But there's a lot of other areas where until we get answers, I can't give you an honest comparison. I appreciate that um, answer, but I will say to you that in this budget, from what I can see, there are significant investments in the city across the board, you know, transportation, uh, supportive housing, all kinds of things that are very beneficial to the city. So we'll continue to go through the process, but um, I believe that when we look at things side by side, at the end of the day, uh, you would prefer this budget over last year's because of those significant investments. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We got five more mayors up there. Commissioner Zucker, I think, and Commissioner Zucker, I think, and Jason Oh, oh, yeah. I saw six mayors. 